<laughs> you guys are in for a treat. Sorry, you had to wait a little bit for it. But hello and welcome to Diversity and Dentistry Mentorship's panel on dental specialties. I'm Dr. Layla Haisha. I'm the founder of the nonprofit Diversity and Dentistry Mentorships, which is has a mission to empower and educate underrepresented minority youth through mentoring. We are reaching our children when they're young, all the way through mentoring our college pre-dental students. And we are trying to do that through mentoring and, and reaching out and sharing information about our profession. And a lot of people think that dentistry is just drilling and filling. And yes, that is, but there's so much more to dentistry on the overall health of a patient's life, a child's life, um, from diagnosing cancer and, and, and compromise, uh, immunocompromised diseases and everything that a physician would need to know, but we are the physicians of the mouth. And the, our specialists here are gonna share how we are making an impact in the lives of others and in dentistry, and there's so much to learn. So we are gonna go through a quick um, introduction. This is the third time for Dr. Warhol, I'm so sorry. <laughs> And then we definitely want to save some time um, for your um, questions. But I am very, very grateful to all of you panelists who've been showing me some patience and also for giving up your time because they are making inroads in their specialty. Um, they are building businesses. They are raising children and families and they are giving back to their community. And in this way, they're volunteering their time to help increase the diversity in dentistry. So with that, I want to welcome Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Detonio Worrell in endodontics. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Hyshaw, for um, you know inviting me to uh, share what I'm passionate about, which is uh, endodontics. Um, so, as Dr. Hyshaw mentioned, I'm a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army. Um, so, I took a, a non-traditional career path in dentistry. Um, but that's the beauty in diversity. There's diversity in our profession as well, um, and there's lots of different roles you can choose. Uh, to practice dentistry. Um, a little bit about myself briefly, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, um, but I was raised in uh, the island of Barbados, like represented here, and um, that's helped shape me into becoming who, who I am today. Um, so straight into it, endodontics. Uh, what is an endodontist? Uh, so endodontics is the field of dentistry that focuses uh, primarily on uh, the prevention and treatment of apical periodontitis, uh, which is a big fancy word of saying uh, inflammation in the, the pulp of the tooth and the root and the surrounding structures. Um, and we prim the primary way in which we treat that is through non-surgical root canal therapy, otherwise known as a root canal. Now, now try not to get too scared. Um, most people associate root canals with pain um, and they forget that they come to the endodontist in pain or swollen or you know um, having you know some serious issues and what we do is we get them out of pain um, reduce swelling pain but we also save the tooth uh, i like to think of us as miracle workers because uh, a lot of times we're situations where teeth may be deemed doomed um, and you know we kind of come through and save the day um, so some examples of where endodontists may come into play are um, think a, a boxer or people that get into fights and get their teeth knocked out. That's another um, form of treatment that we do. Uh, we kind of specialize in uh, traumatic dental injuries. Um, think about uh, you know, a child who's, um, or an adult who's um, you know, gone to an accident, they flew over their bicycle handlebar and landed on their face and their teeth either got completely knocked out or, or, or moved in the socket. We do that. Um, and to be honest, we also do surgical procedures as well. You know, so if you like some dental surgery, we do do a, a procedure, procedure called apicoectomies. Um, we get to play with a lot of toys in endodontics. Um, our two coolest toys, in my opinion, are the dental operating microscope um, and the uh, CBCT or cone beam computed tomography. Um, so with the dental operating microscope, I like to tell people is like we magnify the tooth while, while we're working to the extent where it's almost like walking inside the tooth. Um, and with Kombu, uh, CBCT or cone beam, uh, we get to actually imagine virtually taking the tooth out of the socket and able, and we can rotate it and, and see it in three dimensions. And that allows us to treatment plan um, and you know plan for the case and, and, and strategize on how we're gonna treat the tooth, um, and, including diagnosis. Um, another reason why I love endodontists is because um, 
because of the microscope, we, it keeps our posture correct. You know, <laughs> we are ergonomically focused in endodontics, you know, so when you, if you look at an endodontist, I, just in my opinion, you know, we have the best posture of all the endodontists. I know one of our other specialists on here does yoga. Well, in endodontists, you don't need yoga. Um, <laughs> okay, I, I digress. Um, so typically, uh, our specialty takes maybe an additional two or three years after dental school. Um, after most two-year programs, you'll get a certificate in endodontics. Three-year programs, you'll end up with like a master's degree as well. Um, I think it's a phenomenal field. It's super exciting. And um, I look forward to any other questions uh, people have at the end about dentistry in general, endodontics, or even life in the military as a dentist. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for being such a great mentor. Um, your mentees are very fortunate to have you. You have several and I follow your lead on how you're structuring their, your relationships and staying on them. So thank you for being a part of diversity and dentistry and all you're doing. All right, going to my right, Dr. Ralph Brock in orthodontics. I'm so glad to finally connect. And, um, and I saw you're in Jack and Jill. You're Jack and Jill dad. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, my wife, what you already know with Jack and Jill, it's definitely the wives and the dads get voluntold. Yeah, but, oh, oh, I know, right? <laughs> See, and you were so good. That's why you're like, last minute, you're right on board with me. So thank you. No, I've been married 27 years. I understand voluntold. <laughs> well, yeah. So, you know, orthodontics has always been one of the favorites in specialties. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, I know at one point it was one of the the most competitive, I mean, meaning that they're all competitive, but mo more people yes. are trying to apply. I think that may have shifted a little bit. Tell us a little bit what you know and more about your specialty. Oh, well, sure. Well, uh, orthodontics is um, uh, involved with, uh, in the Latin orthos, to straighten. And so we are involved with straightening the teeth, which for uh, orthodontists, I think you would find that's uh, the thing we would say is the smallest thing we do in our life. So for us, it's always about growth and development and symmetry. Uh, and so how do I influence with the teeth, the things that would happen with the jaw, then those things that would happen with the face. And so it's uh, really cool, uh, really exciting every day. Uh, I find orthodontics for me, and I'm kind of an abstract type of guy, uh, is painting for me. So the brackets are my brushes and the patient is my canvas. So I actually get to paint uh, every day. And it's really cool. So I never really think about it as putting braces on the teeth. I'm trying to figure out what masterpiece am I about to create. So um, it's, uh, of course, your undergraduate degree, then dental school, then another. Uh, most programs nowadays are about uh, 30, 36 months. So you have three years after dental school. It still is very competitive. Uh, you probably find that most programs now uh, or taking the valedictorian, salutatorian, or you know someone in the top 10%. I always kind of give the advice when I mentor kids that you should follow the 10-5-1 rule. Graduate in the top 10% from your high school, graduate in the top 5% from your college, graduate in the top 1% from your dental school. You can pretty much choose what profession you want to be in as far as especially specialty of orthodontics. So 10-5-1 is a good rule. I always give the kids. So even when they're young in high school, junior high, what should I be doing now? Graduating the top 10%, get into the undergrad school you want to be in. Graduating the top 5% from uh, uh, undergrad so you can get into the dental school you want to be in. Graduating the top 1%, you get into the specialty you want to be in. But uh, uh, as Dr. Worrell has said, uh, he loves endodontics. I can tell you, uh, passionate. I love it. And you would probably say that I'm outside of dentistry. I don't do injections. If I see blood, I want to faint. Uh, <laughs> there are, <laughs> yeah, there, there, it, for my day, it's, it's bracket and glue. And luckily for me, people come to me because they are usually not in pain. Thank you, sir. Uh, and they come to me and they want the service. They don't in particular may need it, but they want it. And so mine is a profession of discretionary uh, time and income that uh, a lot of people uh, want. Wonderful. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll come down. I'm going to come down to one of a fan favorite, one of the sought after renowned lecturers, um, Dr. Ron. You have to 
you really could have covered four specialties because <laughs> if you look at his bio in the Facebook group, I ran out of room with all his <laughs> credentials <laughs> from DDS, DMD, uh, MD, and then it just goes on and on. So we're, I'm so, I, and I'm one of those fans too. I've heard you lecture. I've learned so much. Um, I love on his social media pages, everyone who's listening, um, you have to go on because he gives webinars on oral pathology, oral medicine, treating the immunocompromised uh, patient. Um, and for free, I mean, you're just sharing your knowledge and that's really what it's all about, um, just to help everyone grow, um, as, as I know a lot of us are doing so. And, but oral medicine, I mean, you know, oral medicine, radiology, that's one of those specialties that I don't think a lot of pre-dental students or even, you know, high schoolers, middle schoolers, because remember, we're trying to get to plant that seed early in our youth um, to see how exciting dentistry is. So I'm, you take it away. Please, please share more. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's such an honor to be here. You cannot imagine, you know, your introduction is so kind. For me, this is just amazing to be here. I can, you know, I was crossing my fingers that the difficulty, you know, the technical issues that we have, I was, please, 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 I want to get online. I want to, I mean, you will broke my heart. So um, really, seriously, this is an amazing opportunity. I, you know, probably the best way to define my life is I am a teacher and a mentor. I, um, that's what I do for a living. So um, when somebody asks me around, hey, you know, what do you do? And I say, I'm a teacher. And that's true. I, um, the other day I was counting the years that so far I had, I had been involved in education 27 years. Wow. And uh, so I am a teacher and I love to mentor and I love to talk with young kids and I do that every single day of my life. So um, I love the endodontics introduction. I love the, <laughs> I mean, I, when I think about root canal, I really think about tears and I, I mean, I can, I, you know, and when I think about orthodontics, it's for me like dark science. I don't know anything. Honestly, I love orthodontics. I have a great appreciation of orthodontics, but I remember my days in dental school trying to, you know, to, I, I was absolutely, but you know, for our audience, that's the beauty of the different specialties in dentistry. And, and I think so that is the reason that we are doing this panel is to show our young kids that dentistry is a lot more than just, you know, making, you know, doing feelings because that's usually what we think about dentistry. Dentistry is an amazing career, amazing. We, you know, not just only we have specialties, but also I have the greatest appreciation from the family dentist. You know, the family dentist is the one who need to deal with everything. And they need to deal that in a high skill level. Okay, so briefly, um, I just want to say a few words about radiology. Um, I love radiology and I know for the young, you know, kids and future dentists or maybe already dentists who are looking in different specialties, radiology is a wonderful specialty. Um, radiology deals, it's interesting, the name it deals with different forms of radiation, not just only x-rays. Radiology deals with creating imaging. And as you can imagine, radiology is a fundamental component of a diagnosis. So for everybody who will look at this webinar later, radiology is a fundamental component of every single specialty who is involved in this discussion today because radiology is part of the diagnostic process. So if you are a family dentist, if you are an orthodontist, if you are a prostodontist, if you are a periodontist, if you are an endodontist, radiology is really a tool that you have over your desk and you need it in a day by day. I just want to say a few words about radiology that really change the scope of radiology and it's almost like before and after. So, um, and I know this is going to be like what this guy is trying to say, you know, my Kentucky accent made the things a little bit more difficult, <laughs> but radiology really changed the day that CAMBIM CT came to our lives. And I know CBCT or CAMBIM CT for some of the um, kids who are in our audience or dental students who are in our audience, they don't maybe still understand what is a CAMBIM CT, but 
in a simple way, around 1999, 2000, a new technology came to dentistry, which is an amazing technology that allow us to see everything that happened in the face in a three dimension. It was like a, an amazing new beginning. So radiology from 1998 to our days became one of the most critical specialties in our life as a dentist, because now we have access to 3D imaging. And that 3D imaging is an amazing tool for my friends or as surgeons, for my friends, root canal and endodontists, for my friends, orthodontists. So radiology became a fundamental component of dentistry. I can speak about radiology for hours, but we don't have the whole day. The other little space that I want to open is for the new specialty that was welcomed by um, our panel of specialties last year, oral medicine. Um, oral medicine came to my life in the early 2000s. I fell in love with oral medicine. I became an absolutely passionate about oral medicine. Oral medicine is the specialty of dentistry recognized by the Commission of Dental Accreditation and Commission of Dental Specialties in 2019. Oral medicine is the specialty of dentistry that deals with medically compromised patients. Imagine how important is that in dentistry because some patients are coming to the dental office with a complete portfolio of medical problems. And oral medicine is the specialty in dentistry who is the expert in providing care to patients with hypertension, providing care to patients who may are taking a medication who are going to make you have more tendency for bleeding. Oral medicine deals with the medically compromised patients and to the non-surgical treatment of oral lesions. How many things you can get in your life? I know you may are, you know, you may think that, okay, what you can get in your mouth, maybe decay. That's true, you can get decay, but believe me, you can get a lot of different things in your tongue. You can get things here in your palate, everywhere. So oral medicine is the specialty of dentistry which deals with that. Canker sores, cold sores, dry mouth, burning mouth. Yes, there is a condition that we call burning mouth and there is a specialty in dentistry who deals with burning mouth. So. I will be very happy to wait until the end if there's any question. Uh, hope is not too many questions because I will stay here until 11 p.m. <laughs> going through these two amazing things. But, but thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you oh, so much. Thank you. thank you. We're so happy you're here too. Great, great, great. Moving on. Dr. Anamalechi, my cohort in pediatric dentistry. She also has an MPH in public health. So tell us more. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, as said before, I'm Janelle Anamalechi. I have some of my other colleagues who will dig a little deeper in the pediatric dentistry. So I'll talk a bit about public health. But um, before I get into public health, I do want to add in terms of the things that I've learned to love over these 16 years of practice in pediatric dentistry is we started subspecializing. So I see lots of breastfeeding moms for different conditions in terms of lack of ability to breastfeed because of lip and tongue ties. Uh, we have sleep apnea special, specialty clinics. And so a part of our pediatric dentistry for me is now moved from drilling and filling um, to many other things that involve the child. And so then as we talk about public health, a lot of people when they hear public health, they just think free. And that's not true. Um, there are so many realms to public health because we're looking at the who, the what, the why, the how of the person who's wearing those teeth and why the things that happen, why the conditions that happen inside of the body, inside of the mouth, how it relates to the entire world. So where it pairs with pediatric dentistry is almost kind of like a no-brainer because we're starting from the beginning we're seeing how the social determinants of health actually track and trend for our kids. I've worked in oral health policy on the Hill. I'm in academia now, I'm in private practice now. Um, all of those things shape the way I practice because then I can practice almost as a whole body dentist. I can sometimes treat the whole family because there are needs and barriers that a family may have 
that may prevent the child from getting the oral health treatment that they need. So that's kind of how it all gets put together um, in my daily life in pediatric dentistry and uh, with a uh, master's in public health. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's one of those uh, specialties that I really think we need to just um, explain a little bit more to, to our, our students. So thank you so much. And now moving over to Dr. Fatima Robertson, as I said earlier, we went to dental school together. <laughs> Dr. Yes, Dr. we did. And yes, we did. To, through this, honestly, I've reconnected with so many uh, classmates and colleagues has just been the cherry on top. And I'm so happy to see you doing just wonderfully. And you are Thank one you. of the few black women periodontists. So I am anxious for you to share more about your specialty and how awesome it is and how awesome you are. <laughs> Thank you, Layla, Dr. Hi, Shaw. So I just wanted to say that uh, just a little bit about me. My name is Fatima Robertson. Um, I am a small town girl. I actually was born in a small town in Mississippi called Natchez, Mississippi. My parents moved us to St. Louis where I grew up and I actually went to dental school at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. I actually went there on a fast track program. I was in what they call a six year advanced or accelerated program. So right out of high school, I went into dental school, uh, did undergraduate in two years and then finished my dental school degree. Um, that was a lot. It was major for me. So at the end of that, I decided that I didn't want to go back to school anymore. I was done. Uh, but truth be told, I actually always wanted to be a periodontist. It's actually what I scored higher in in the part two of the boards. So with dental school, there's a part one and there's a part two. In part two boards, it's what I scored highest in and it's what I've always loved. I'm a bit of a nerd, a bit of a, a geek. I'm an avid reader. And so I think that's one of the things that draws the people that are interested in my specialty to that specialty, because it is a lot of reading, it is a lot of engaging, it is a lot of literature study. And ultimately, um, a lot of the things that we do are or have to be evidence based. Um, my field is involved in what we call working outside of or around the tooth. What we do is we protect the supporting structure of the tooth. So we deal with the attachment of the tooth. Pretty much a, the mainstay of my job is taking care of people that have periodontal disease or gum disease. And we also do a lot of oral medicine, Dr. Yeeps. I often get a lot of referrals for oral medicine for things that are going wrong with the tongue or the cheeks and things like that. A little bit of overlap with myself and an oral surgeon, Dr. Portia, we do a couple of things that they would do in terms of dental implants. So when we look at the total amount of the population, having 50% or more people have gum disease, and then approximately 2.4 million people have one or more missing teeth, the future looks bright for periodontists. So I want to encourage anyone that's interested in that field to really consider it. Um, remember that you do have to be an avid reader. Um, and so a lot of that is uh, going to depend on your personality profile. But a little bit about myself, I've been in private practice since 2006 with my business partner, who is an endodontist, uh, just like Dr. Worrell. So those two specialties tend to work together well. What she can't say if I take out and I put an implant in. <laughs> so <laughs> we work really well together. So Essentially, that is what I do on a daily basis, and I would like to encourage anyone that's on the call to consider a career in periodontics. There are not many of us in terms of African Americans. As a matter of fact, in my program, I think I was probably the second graduate, um, second African American graduate. The first one was probably about eight years prior to me. So diversity in dentistry is important, and um, Pretty much if you're interested, please contact me. We, I'm sure we're gonna have some information in the, in the chat a little later on. So I'd be happy to mentor someone. Oh, Thanks, thank Dr. Heish. Thank you so much. You're I will welcome. say, you know, when I was comprising this panel, thank goodness I knew you because <laughs> it is hard when you are looking for diverse, <laughs> underrepresented minority specialists, especially those um, in periodontology. So, then it, it just was a realization how how we do need to make a make an make a change and increase that diversity. So I'm so glad that you're you're here.
And going down to Dr. Portia James, she is our oral maxillofacial surgeon. I really look up to her because I just think that <laughs> challenging. <laughs> Definitely nothing I would want to do. Um, but you, um, of course, I'm sure you have so many stories of um, having to, um, well, being lucky, hopefully, to uh, diagnose and treat oral cancerous lesions that early and saving lives. Um, mm -hmm. This wisdom attractions that the oral surgeons do is just so much more. So please share share that with us. <laughs> Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Portia James. I'm an oral and maxillofacial surgeon uh, here in Frisco, Texas, which is a suburb outside of Dallas. Uh, I actually uh, went to dental school at Meharry Medical College. I went to undergrad at Xavier University of Louisiana. Let me preface that. Um, then went on to dental school at Meharry Medical College. Uh, my path was a little bit different. After I graduated from dental school, I actually went into the Air Force. So I was a general dentist in the Air Force for four years, um, where I was stationed in England for a couple of years. And that particular base was slotted for two oral surgeons. Of course, at the time, there was a shortage of oral surgeons there. So um, I was a general dentist that had an interest in oral surgery. So I was able to do a lot of surgical procedures. I was able to go to the operating room with the oral surgeon at the time. So that kind of you know, kind of threw me into it. So what else could I do, right? So uh, I separated from the military after I got accepted um, into Meharry Medical College program for oral and maxillofacial surgery. So I went on uh, and completed an additional four years um, of that residency program. So oral and maxillofacial surgeons are the gunners, okay? <laughs> uh, the people that don't like sleep. <laughs> so, but but um, we are considered the experts in the face, in the mouth, and in jaw surgery. So a lot of things that we will do could vary from, you know, something as simple as doing dental extraction and implants to going to the hospital and treating a gunshot wound to the face and basically, you know, putting a puzzle piece of a skeleton back together to get the patient's face back to where you know they were prior to an accident. Um, things vary such as oral cancers or head and neck cancers, um, facial cosmetic surgeries, which is something that I enjoy doing. And different things, we do corrective jaw surgery. We work with, with the orthodontists as far as doing what's called orthognathic surgeries, where we might bring the upper and lower jaw forwards or backwards or do different things to get the um, face back into alignment and to get the occlusion back to where it's supposed to be. Supposed to be. Um, just various different things in our specialty, TMJ surgeries, we do joint replacements. Um, I think that our specialty could, it, it's so, it varies in so much that we do. Um, even if you decide, you can subspecialize um, afterwards as well. So you can do a fellowship after surgery. If you truly enjoy, let's say for example, um, facial cosmetic surgery, you can go on to do a fellowship in that, or you can do a fellowship in um, head and neck surgeries as well. So the education varies from four to six years. The six year program, you also get a, a MD. So you do two years of medical school. Um, and then after that, like I stated, that you can go on to do a fellowship, you know, which can be one plus years, depending on what you want to do. Some people even that do the six year program because they have the medical doctor, they even go in to do other things. Some people are doing actual full body cosmetic surgeries and things like that. So uh, the, the specialty, it, it varies so much. We do so many different things, but the residency to get into residency, I, I, I joked about being a gunner, but we are truly, you have to be very dedicated, very hardworking, um, you, because you are not going to get sleep, <laughs> to be honest. You're not going to get much sleep um, because you're going to be on call a lot. Um, you're going to be seeing patients and doing surgeries throughout the night and then go to clinic the next day to see your routine patients and round your, your hospital patients that morning. So 
I truly love what I do. You, if you follow my page, you know that I love to do, of course we do the wisdom teeth and implants, but I love to do a lot of cosmetic procedures. So you'll see me doing the Botox and the fillers, or we might be doing some mental lipo one day, or we might be doing a blepharoplasty, lower lid, eyelid surgery, things like that. So that's what I love to do. Oh, so. <laughs> Sorry, my, my battery thing went off. So, but I, I'm so happy that you asked me to be on this panel. Um, I hope that I'm able to answer questions that students might have or whatnot. A lot of the, the students always DM me or send me emails and things. So I'm happy to answer any questions um, that any of the, the students or potential students have. Oh, so I nice. welcome that. Yeah, now you guys know that if she can't get back to you right away, it's because she has not slept. <laughs> So put it in the group. That's why we have our community. Hopefully, so if you have the question, chances are thousands of others do as well. Okay, we are moving on down to Dr. Nikea Franklin. She is a pediatric dentist, and she has been, I want to thank you publicly, uh, one of my first volunteers through the mentorship program by writing those you know, comprehensive <laughs> blog, especially the last one with the dental specialties, I think it has been such a helpful resource for our students. So thank you for taking the time to do that and sharing your knowledge as well. And tell them how awesome pediatric dentistry is. <laughs> oh my goodness. I don't think we have enough time tonight to talk about how awesome pediatric dentistry is. Um, you guys can talk about not sleeping or great posture. Um, I do sleep well. I have terrible posture from looking over for my yeah, little right. kids. But I would say pediatric dentistry is definitely the most fun out of all of the specialties. Like every day I wear corgi socks. I have whatever type of earrings I want. I can tell the worst jokes and I'm perceived really funny because most of my operative patients are breathing laughing gas. So I love what I do. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Hyshaw, for organizing all of this and for the invite and letting me um, just kind of volunteer and put together the little articles. Um, little plug for that. If you guys come up with any ideas and you're like, you know, I'd like to know more about this, feel free to message me. I'm definitely looking for ideas for things to write about. Yeah. So um, I am from Oklahoma, born and raised. Um, I went to University of Oklahoma for undergrad, did three years, got out, went to Baylor College of Dentistry uh, in Texas, and did my dental education there, and then went to Indiana University for my pediatric dental residency, where I had the most amazing and very challenging research mentor, Dr. Yepes. Um, and if you were late to class, like, oh my goodness. <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay, we won't, he won't tell you about that tonight. Um, basically, what I do is a lot of fun, and I loved all of dentistry, actually. I, I went in to dental school and kind of thought I wanted to do orthodontics, so I was like, okay, I'm going to graduate in the top 5%, um, and then kind of last minute, I was just like, you know what, I love working with young people. I miss the hospital aspects. I love working with patients who have kind of compromised health conditions, who have special needs, um, who are very nervous or need that extra little mm of energy because I think that's what a lot of us pediatric dentists bring. And I just kind of felt like my personality was going to fit better for the needier population of little children and nervous patients in general. Um, so I loved my pediatric rotations. I loved anything that I did um, in the hospital and kind of getting to shadow and doing those externships. I was in love with pediatric dentistry. And I like that there's so many different parts of it. Now, although dentistry is very important in what I do, and certainly we want to have amazing technique, there's maybe not as many things as like um, some of the other dentists have talked about, you know, oral surgery where you're doing whole body or um, facial surgeries. You know, I'm not doing more than maybe 10 things routinely. And when I have to do something complicated, I'm talking to like Dr. Worrell, or I'm sending x-rays to Dr. Yepes, or I'm sending them to the orthodontist. 
Um, I actually work with every single specialty that is here. So I feel like my specialty is more about psychology, child development, behavioral management. The toughest thing that I deal with is actually working with parents and with children who are nervous and my special needs families. And so the dentistry isn't necessarily the most challenging part of my work week. Um, I love it because of the opportunities. There's a financial term called compounding interest. And really quick, because everybody should know about finances um, before you take on these big debts. Basically, if you start saving 10 years earlier than somebody else, by the time that you retire, you, even if you save the same amount of money, you'll have like almost a million dollars more. Okay, so I feel like as a pediatric dentist, I get to invest my energy and my time at the very beginning, at the youngest ages. You know, my one, my two-year-olds that come in and we have to literally extract possibly all 20 teeth, 18 out of 20 teeth on a kid that's less than three in the operating room. That kid still has hope. They still have a chance for a much better dental future for a amazing effects for their entire life, just a healthier, happier life with better nutrition, better speech, more confidence. And I feel like if we catch them young, um, we just get so much of an opportunity to make a difference. And I absolutely love that part about my job every day. There hasn't been a single day in my entire five years of doing this that I haven't woken up like excited to go to work. Maybe a little tired, but always excited. And the kids are always fun. And sometimes they're not, but even then, it's not their fault. They're just a kid. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You're definitely, I'm sure, everyone's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move on to our prosthodontist, Dr. Eva Boldridge. Please tell us more about your specialty, and of course, thank you again for your patience hanging on till the end here. And we're oh, glad. That's fine. Uh, uh, Eva Boldridge here. I'm here in Houston, Texas. Um, I'm a prosthodontist and a maxillofacial prosthodontist. I had my training at dental school in South Carolina, MUSC. And then I had my pros training at University of Alabama, Birmingham, UAB. And I said, you know what? I want to do more. And I ended up coming here to Houston and subspecialize in maxillofacial prosthodontics. So, um, I was the first person of color or first black woman, first black person to graduate from the UAB grad pros program and the same from MD Anderson as well. So um, I've been in practice for 20 years, juggling that and motherhood. Um, and uh, prosthodontics is really, I like to say, you know, initially when I got into pros, it was a lot different. It's changed immensely since the advent of digital dentistry, cone beam imaging. Uh, historically, we're known as lab rats. I am a lab rat. I spend a lot of time after hours, you know, but now it's not as much diagnostic wax up like we used to. Now it's digital. Uh, we have to use a lot of imaging to kind of plan uh, full mouth restorations. Some people think it's just crown and bridge, but uh, it's crown and bridge, it's dentures, it's implants all integrated. So we work with a lot of the specialists to work together to get the patient's whole oral situation stable. And that, that requires a lot of education, re-education of patients, because most of the time when they see me, uh, there has been some neglect, some things they didn't know about their diet, medications, all these things can affect the whole oral cavity and how, you know, their whole state of being. So a lot of education goes into the first end. Uh, treatment can take a while, but um, you know we work a lot with the surgeons, the oral surgeons and the periodontists. We work with orthodontists as well. 
Uh, we definitely need um, a pathology because my patient load is usually more of the more mature age. Um, I do a lot of geriatrics as well. Uh, I do a lot of oral cancer screenings uh, for free on my patients because oral cancer is rising uh, with the HPV. Uh, like I said before, the digital imaging is just taking things to a whole another level. I just got off of a five hour symposium about how the digital with the dentures is just going through the roof. Uh, we had a lot of dental dentistry with just Crown and Bridge, but now we're really getting to use it on um, people who have no teeth at all and being able to do things without articulators. I know some of the doctors here would love to hear that. Uh, you know, how we're doing it without articulators, how we're doing things virtually by just taking pictures, how we're doing it by just taking it a comb bean image and implementing it into a program and redesigning a patient's smile. Uh, it's really exciting. Uh, right now, there's about, every year there's around 2,500 applicants for 160 positions. Oh, wow. There's only, as I know, one program that's Perio and Pros, and that's in San Antonio, um, that's, you know, certified. There are a few that, um, that do it, but I think the ones that are um, up to, you know, whatever, uh, is San Antonio. Um, I love Pros. We are definitely, you definitely have to be able to work with other people, uh, which I think historically sometimes prosthodontists didn't have that, uh, didn't have that reputation. Uh, but now um, we're seeing a whole big change in the whole landscape of who's wanting to join in pros. Uh, the biggest change was around 2015 when all the programs made it a requirement to place implants. I was part of the group that didn't have to. I actually go to all my patient surgeries, but I'm a diva. I like to create and I like to tell people what to do, but I don't wanna do the surgery. But now all Pros residents that graduate have to have a competency to place implants. And uh, so that is like the biggest thing since I left. I'm, I'm kind of a nerd too. My nerd is playing with the, um, the imaging and the programs. I have a 3D printer. I have an intraoral 3D scanner and I have a benchtop scanner. So I'm always trying to figure out ways to do things differently. And I'm just really excited because I think in prosthodontics, we're kind of like the, we had the reputation of just being the old rickety boring, but I think within the past five, 10 years, it's just taken off. And uh, the last thing I wanted to say is that of all like 200,000 dentists in the United States, less than 2% are prosthodontists. We're probably the least known of all the specialties, but we are actually the ones who have to have the ability to be able to work with and know what we're doing to help um, design a patient's smile to make it healthy and functional because we're not just usually replacing teeth, we're replacing teeth and some of the bone structure in the jaw sometimes. So I love PROS and I love maxillofacial PROS and that's usually sidebar. We're dealing with patients with head and neck cancer, trauma patients. So unfortunately, Dr. Portia, I had to be on call when I was pregnant and I had to go into a surgery uh, at 10 o'clock at night because a patient couldn't make it till the next morning. So I know about being on call. That was a new experience for me. Uh, <laughs> I think I had the record for the most on-call Cummins during my residency, and I was very pregnant at the time. So um, I work with uh, surgeons in the city with a lot of patients with mandibular resections. I I'm, um, I'm have a case coming in on Monday where we're getting her ready to do a vestibuloplasty, and then we'll work after she's healed to do a hybrid denture. Uh, we also work with patients who um, have cleft palate. If you follow me on social media, I usually show those cases. Sometimes we have to work with even speech pathologists to make sure that we're helping patients um, be able to speak and function properly. So PROS is a lot. Um, you, as a resident, you, you don't have a lot of sleep, but it's not because you're in the OR, it's because you're in a lab or you're on your computer, so. <laughs> But I love props. <laughs> that is 
it's really, yeah, you know, I think on call is hazing for dentistry and all. It is. <laughs> I hate being on call. <laughs> But it's part of the job, as we're always there for you. Uh, well, thank you, thank you. That's a lot it has changed since I've come out in 2000. Um, prosthodontics, maybe I might have been a little bit more interested, but I did not like waxing up those. <laughs> All right, let's, let's um, before we end with Dr. Amanda Akunda, who is our dental anesthesiologist, I did want to point out that unfortunately, Dr. Ride and Dr. Suarez can make the call. However, we'll be reaching out to them to see if they can uh, leave some information. If you can, if you ask questions, I can get those to them and so that they, they can respond. But please, please, so dental anesthesia, anesthesia is one of the newer uh, recognized residencies, um, especially us in pediatric dentistry utilize them quite a bit. Um, so I will let you explain more of that. So welcome, welcome, doctor. Thank you, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, well, as you said, my name is Dr. Amanda Kundaye, and you said it right. Um, I am a dentist anesthesiologist. I am uh, one of 20 that graduated from UCLA. Um, I was the only black female of those 20. Um, so this is huge for me to be on here with you all. First of all, we just became a specialty just like oral medicine last year. March 11th was a huge day for us as dentist anesthesiologists. So to be on this panel is, is huge because we're considered a specialist. So that's pretty awesome. Um, I myself had a roundabout journey. So in dental school, I knew nothing about dental anesthesiology, first of all. Um, I did go to the wonderful Meharry, which I got a great education, um, but did further my education after that by doing an AGD. And during my AGD, I met my mentor and friend who introduced me to the world of drugs. And I um, was able to meet a dentist anesthesiologist who, who kind of said, here, let's first get you um, a permit in moderate sedation, see how you like providing sedation for your phobic adult patients. Once that happened, it was over. I just fell in love with the medical part of dentistry and loved total body health at that point. And then went on to kind of further my education in, GP, in a GPR program, because at that point I needed way more medicine before I can go into an anesthesia residency where there's no dentistry at all. So I haven't done dentistry myself since 2004. And I don't mess it, sorry. I do extractions here and there with um, the residents. Um, as a dentist anesthesiologist, um, I did a program at UCLA, which at the time to me was the best program in the country. Um, but where we are basically thrown in and one of 13 to 15 anesthesia residents, medical anesthesia residents. So nobody even knew I was a dentist, honestly, unless they looked at my ID because we function the same way as a CA1, they call them a first year anesthesia resident in the hospital. So the first time they knew I was a dentist, a little quick story is I went down, I carried the airway pager, went down to the ER because we had to do an emergency intubation. And at the end of a, a code or an intubation, you call out your names. And I said, Amanda Okunde, DDS, and the entire room stopped and stared at me. They were like, what are you doing down here? And why did you just do that intubation in five seconds? Um, <laughs> so they, um, it's different. And I absolutely loved it. But just like Dr. Portia said, we are on call. We don't sleep for a good, well, three years now. All dental anesthesia residencies in the country are three years. When I was a resident back in 06, they were only two years. So I did one full year in the hospital functioning as a first year anesthesia resident with the medical anesthesia resident. And so you have to play catch up a little bit as a dental anesthesia resident because you had four years of dental school and you didn't have the medicine background um, like they did. So my GPR, I, I basically say that was my intern year um, because you have to be just as medically savvy and smart and read and be up on the literature just like your physician anesthesia colleagues. Mm -hmm. And so it's tough. We don't sleep. We're on call every other night. Um, it, but it's fantastic. Um, and so as a dentist anesthesiologist, we function in different ways. So my private practice in particular here in Las Vegas is about 60% pediatric dentistry. So the beauty of this panel is I get to work with every single one of you. So I augment every dental specialty, every dental practice every day. So um, we do, we provide general anesthesia in the office, in the hospital. It is a regional thing. Um, in the West Coast, it is very much a mobile 
private practice in office general anesthesia practice. And that's what I do. I bring a whole huge, basically OR on wheels with me to different offices every single day. Um, and so I'm about 60% pediatric dentistry, about 30% oral surgery. Um, between pedo and oral surgery, it's a beautiful marriage. There, you know, we put the pediatric patients to sleep while you do full mouth dentistry. For oral surgery, there's four eyes in the room that know what's going on when it comes to medical emergencies, big surgeries. We do big orthognathic cases together, big all on fours, um, huge, wonderful cases. Um, but really good um, relationship between the two. Um, and then the other part of my practice is I'm part-time faculty at the university. So I get to teach local, uh, advanced local techniques and teach the dental students and give them exposure to dental anesthesiology, which I absolutely love. And the other part of my practice is special needs and phobic adults. And the special needs population for what we do is huge. So we see every patient on the spectrum from mildly autistic to our cerebral palsy patients, to our Parkinson's patients, to you name it, anyone who can't have a, a normal quote unquote dental procedure, we are there to provide the anesthesia for them so that you can get work done and get your dentistry done. So um, I absolutely love doing anesthesia. Again, don't miss dentistry, sorry guys. Um, you're talking about articulators and stuff and I married a prosthodontist and you would not know there's two dentists in the household. I'll tell you that right now because he's talking like nonsense and I'm talking medicine. So um, <laughs> that's, that's that. But yeah, dental anesthesiology is a wonderful field for young people. I know a couple of Meharians, female, black females, who are applying right now to dental anesthesia, and I'm super excited. So thank you. Oh, that is exciting. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, so the other two disciplines was uh, oral maxillofacial uh, pathology and oral facial pain, which is one of the newest specialties. Dr. Yepes, do you want to comment on uh, either of those two just really briefly? Yes, absolutely. I, um, I will, I promise very briefly. Orofacial pain uh, just uh, is probably the newest uh, dental specialty on board. Orofacial pain in some way is the parallel with neurology. So for the students who are listening to this um, live Facebook, and you go to the neurologist and you go with pain and you have pain in your extremities, pain in your back. Well, orofacial pain, they deal with the non-surgical management of pain in the orofacial structures. It's a beautiful specialty, very academic. Um, usually takes between two and three years after dental school. Mm -hmm. um, I had the opportunity to work at the University of Kentucky before working in Indiana, which is my workplace now. And the University of Kentucky is one of the most well-known places of orofacial pain in the country. Um, they are highly academic. Uh, they are very also into reading books like the periodontist colleagues. They read a lot. They, uh, and they know a lot about pharmacology because they need to be experts in prescribing medications, different medications for patients with orofacial pain. And finally, a few words about oral and maxillofacial pathology, which is that the specialty of dentistry and you can tell by the name, who deals with the oral pathology and all the different issues that you can get in the mouth besides dental caries and periodontal disease. It's also a beautiful specialty. Usually they go to um, programs that I believe they are at least three years after dental school, uh, very highly academic. Um, they also have the opportunity to work in hospitals and they have rotations in a hospital. Sometimes they are on call and they spend a lot of the time looking at the microscope and looking at different lesions after taking a biopsy, which is taking a little piece of the lesion and putting that in the microscope. In the oral and maxillofacial pathologies, they look under the microscope and they provide a definitely diagnosis. It's just amazing. I will tell you, it's so cool to be here, listening to all the different specialties and how we, I mean, how amazing is this career? We're how different cool. options we have. Yeah, it's amazing. Whenever I have a patient who says they want to go to med school, I'm like, why? <laughs> and I'm married to a neurologist. <laughs> and he would attest that dentistry is way better, way better hours, except for once you get through residency. All right. We yeah, I, you know, I will tell you something that um, the other day I was in a, in a meeting with, uh, in a dinner with a periodontist, an endodontist, an orthodontist, and an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. So we were having dinner. So the oral surgeon stopped everybody and say, you know what? Yesterday, 
We have a very complicated surgery, le four one, which is a very complex surgery. I put the jaw back in a patient. And then the orthodontist, I have a very complicated patient with all the teeth around and I fix it. <laughs> then the root canal specialist, I have a tooth with a root like this and I use my microscope and I, and then I was sitting there as a pediatric dentist and I said, well, my friends, I did a sealant. <laughs> and look at me and say, what's up with you? Just a sealant? And I say, yes, but mom was like this. I mean, was next to me. And I told the, and I told the kid, don't move the tongue. And the kid was, uh, and I said, please keep that space dry. And then everybody told me, that's right. Pediatric dentistry is the most difficult specialty. <laughs> Thank you. We did a good laugh right there. I'm going to remember that. I thought you were about to lead into a joke, but that's better. <laughs> all right, all right. So questions, questions. Um, I'm going to go straight into the ones that I received. Um, and then if we, I, and I thank you guys for staying a little bit after. So uh, this is a, a pretty common question that once you specialize, are you allowed to work as a general dentist anymore? There seems to be contradicting answers. And so a lot of students are asking. So if you want to take it, unmute yourself and please reply. Um, I'll unmute myself. Um, as a dentist anesthesiologist, um, a lot of my colleagues, especially again regionally, in the East Coast, a lot of them practice as operator anesthetists. So a lot of them are general dentists, um, or we have pediatric dentists that also put their own patients to sleep, whether intubated or not. And so they practice both. Um, again, on the West Coast, it's a little different. Most of us that are dentist anesthesiologists don't practice dentistry, but we could per our license. So yes, you can practice dentistry and be a dentist anesthesiologist or other uh, specialties, yes. I'd like to say as a prosthodontist, historically, most people didn't even advertise as prosthodontist because no one knew what it was. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm actually one of the few, there's a few in our city who do pros only, but where I am, uh, a lot of the prosthodontists, um, they advertise as uh, do general but I'm one of the few that say I only do prosthodontics and maxillofacial prosthodontics. So a lot of prosthodontics, prosthodontists have practiced just general dentistry. You, you really want to make sure that whatever you're doing, you love. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, I know a few of you mentioned that you did uh, start out as a general dentist, kind of not traditional, starting off with that before going straight into specialty. Um, would you recommend it? If so, would you recommend it or, or not? So I can speak, so I know, so I was a general dentist for five years um, after dental school before going into residency. Uh, and I, I never mentioned that I did attend the University of Maryland Dental School, the first dental college in the world. Right. Um, and I'm very proud of that. Um, but um, yes, I, I believe that, actually I know that I'm a better endodontist because um, I spent those years as a general dentist. Um, you know, it, your perspective on what you're doing in your specialty, in my opinion, um, is going to be informed by the end result, you know, and uh, as you heard, a lot of us work with one another, you know, the specialties all kind of interact. It's like a song and dance to provide the best treatment for the patient. And so if you have that understanding of what the other person needs or the other specialist or the general dentist, the, you know, what they need, what they ultimately need you to do it helps inform what you your treatment. So th that's my opinion. Right. Yeah, I would I would have to agree with that. Um, for for me, I, I was a general dentist as well for four years, and I think even as a specialist, um, placing implants and things like that because I've restored them before. A lot of times, mm -hmm. if I would have gone straight into residency you know, as an oral surgeon, I wouldn't have, have, have restored or had any knowledge about that. So you kind of see things um, in your mind a little bit different. Um, you can place an implant anywhere, but can this be restored? <laughs> the, because that's the final result. So um, I think that when I, my approach is a little bit different um, for the surgical side, and I'm also looking at the restorative side of things too. And, and, and I'm also able to, I think, guide um, a lot of my referrals as well, especially if they're new 
um, kind of new at a school, I can kind of help them, okay, well, this is how you restore this and, and things like that. So I can do courses with them as well. So it, I think we can work together, um, like you said. So it, it helps a lot. I think it's interesting that you were saying that about the course year because I went straight through. So um, I was at the University of North Carolina and then went straight through the residency. And, um, but I found the need to, to do more. Like I was, I needed to see more and more. I wanted to see more and more and more patients to make sure like I had that experience because I was a hands-on learner. So I just felt like, you know, I wanted to, if I could work on weekends and do this, that, or the other, I needed to see as many patients as possible. So at least I felt like I was a bit more confident presenting myself and working as soon as I got out. So I definitely see your perspective on that. And, and I found that for me, I just needed to see more in a kind of consolidated time period. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, especially with yeah, the... Oh. Sorry, Dr. Brock, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say for orthodontics, I, I went straight uh, from dental school straight into ortho. You find in dental school, unless you know the secret handshake, you don't really learn much about orthodontics or get to do much with orthodontics. So in orthodontic school, you focus primarily on orthodontics and then, you know, sort of interdisciplinary care with all the rest of the specialties while you're in there. So uh, for orthodontics in particular, because you don't get to do or learn much more than how to uh, adjust a retainer uh, in dental school. Uh, orthodontic school is great. I like to put in there also that um, I went straight through. Um, I process three years and maxillofacial process one year, but now um, it's getting a little bit harder. So they're recommending that um, people who are trying to apply do more AGD, GPRs to make sure their skills are up to par to be able to handle the course load that they are getting now. Yeah, but Dr. Bolter, would you um, explain the AGD and GPR program? Um, the AGD and the GPR is the Advanced Education and General Dentistry and the, uh, ge uh, the General Practice Residency. Um, a lot of those are like an extra year after graduating from dental school, I used to be faculty in the AGD GPR clinic here in Houston. And it's just a way to expose the residents to a little bit more, push them to go a little bit faster, expose them to the hospital experience, um, patients with special needs, more advanced treatment than you would get in dental school. So it's just an added plus. It really wasn't a requirement when I was getting in. I'll be honest, it just seemed like not a lot of people wanted to do cross back in the day, but it's, it's changed a lot. Um, so that a lot of people do that even before they go into private practice, just to get their skills up, their speed up, their knowledge um, base. It's just an extra year to just learn more. Yeah, and then I, I visited my, my alma mater, UMKC School of Dentistry, and I saw they have like a real kind of realistic dental clinic, dental operatory, so you can get a little practice in private practice and how to run and you're having auxiliary staff. So I think GPR AGD is very helpful if you don't go straight into a specialty. Um, now, it's also, um, just, just a few coming in some states, you know, for the students and future dental students who are listening to this uh, Facebook Live, there is one state that is a requirement to go into one year of GPR, AGD, or any dental specialty. So if you want to practice in New York after dental school, um, it's a requirement that you need to go into a, either GPR or general practice residency program, AGD, or any of the dental specialties. Um, so, uh, you know, a few words also just to, to make this discussion very interesting about oral medicine. Remember I mentioned that oral medicine deals with medically compromised patients. So uh, the majority of oral medicine, especially, they also have pretty good skills as a dentist because, um, you know, they provide dentistry with, to patients that they need something in the mouth, but at the same time, they have a severe medical condition that make the treatment a little bit more different. So they are the experts in the medical protocols to provide a pretty optimal dental care to this group of patients. So oral medicine usually, which is two years, I went to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, which is one of the home places for oral medicine. And uh, during our training in oral medicine, we also had the opportunity to work in general dentistry in clinics who are designed for medically compromised patients. 
Mm-hmm. And Dr. Yepitz, I did not know that you, you still are in private practice with all your teaching and presenting. So yeah, you, um, I also you know, want to know how you did all the, re- all the different residencies. What kept you going? <laughs> Why you didn't stop uh, at residency? Help of my brain doesn't work very well. So um, every single year, and my wife told me one more thing, and then I will. <laughs> so um, finally, I stopped. <laughs> no, I, I, I honestly, I, um, uh, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I am an immigrant from originally from Colombia. I moved to the United States about 24, 25 years ago, and I, um, I was adopted by the U.S. in 2008 when I became a U.S. citizen, very proud. And um, since I came to this country, I always work, you know, as hard as I can to try to all the doors who open for me, because honestly, in the way I initially came to the University of Iowa in the middle of Iowa City, I mean, in the middle of Iowa, which is in Iowa City. And then after that, all the different places, uh, really the doors open and I keep, keep doing all the things that I did it because I have wonderful mentors and I really want to learn. I have this idea that I need to be a good teacher and I keep learning and pediatric dentistry came late to my life. Um, I became a pediatric dentistry, it seems to be yesterday, but I graduated in 2012. So I have been practicing pediatric dentistry for eight years. But when I combine my life, my past life and my present life is a perfect combination between oral medicine and pediatric dentistry, radiology and pediatric dentistry and dental public health. I did dental public health at Baylor College of Dentistry and I board certified dental public health. But I think so. Um, this is a wonderful arena to show all the students that, you know, when you work hard, you know, the opportunities are there waiting for us. Mm-hmm. And uh, there is nothing who can tell us that we cannot do because honestly, you just need to keep going. And sometimes the doors close, life comes with bumps. That's the real life. And, but it's our you know, spirit who will keep going even if we have sometimes bumps like a plane, but it's, it's, it, we, we need to be able to jump over the bumps and continue looking for our education, which I really believe that education is the key in life. So. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you thank you for those sharing those words and this, is, um, this is amazing example of that <laughs> and um, you know what I, I will tell something funny also prostodontics are the real dentist <laughs> honestly I, I, you know for the students who are listening when i talk i have two things about dental specialties the most scientific specialists in dentistry, this is for the students who are listening to this webinar, the ones who deal with the neutrophile, the inflammation, and they spend hours in the periodontal disease and how these things are the periodontists. They are highly academic. They read and read and read and read and read and read. And the prostodontics, wow, I mean, I, that's amazing. Do you know the, 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 the amazing pros? I am just, I admire so much the prostodontics. They are just amazing. I need to say that. <laughs> well, yes, yes. <laughs> well deserved. <laughs> okay, real quick here. Um, when should students start looking to specialize? Dr. Robertson, you mentioned you scored well in periodontics in part two, but you knew early on, I mean, I think you had that, that goal is early if you were in high school knowing you wanted to be a dentist. Not everyone knows that. <laughs> I did. I knew by the time I was 16, I wanted to be a dentist, but that's because I had a great mentor um, that took me when I was a young kid and kind of molded me and shaped me. And so he helped me kind of decide that I wanted to do a career, have a career in dentistry. But I don't think it was actually until maybe the fall semester of the second year, you know, when you have that storm of uh, that midterm and you've got the prost exam, the perio exam, you've got the oral surgery exam, the ortho exam. I think that's the fall semester of the second year. I think we, at UMKC, I think we call it Black October, but it's the fall of that, it's that October of that second year in dental school. And I think that's when I decided that I wanted to go to um, become a periodontist because that's just what I gravitated toward. So I think that to answer your question, some people come in knowing exactly what they want to do. Those are the lucky people, I think. Um, those are the people who have mothers and fathers or family members that are dentists, and they've been able to be shaped and molded into, 
you know, deciding what they want to do early. I don't think you always know, but I think the ones that come in knowing exactly what they want to do and they have a laser focus, I think those are the lucky ones. But I don't think you really even have to know after dental school. It doesn't always happen for everybody. You're not going to always be an early bloomer. You may be a late bloomer. And you just kind of follow your passion follow your heart. Like Dr. Yepes was saying, periodontists tend to be a little bit more avid readers. We tend to be a little bit more nerdly, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> we tend to be more scientific. Nerdly. We like to congregate. <laughs> yeah, we like to congregate in small groups and talk about bacteria, which is kind of, eh. <laughs> but <laughs> that's just kind of what it is. But <laughs> so, yeah. um, Well, thank you. Thank you. Dr. James, this question is for you. Um, you know, I, I think, and of course, in dentistry in general, it, it was male prominent um, in the past, um, but now we have more than 55% women. But I imagine in oral surgery, not only did you have to overcome some obstacles of maybe, well, and of course, prosthodontists, I shouldn't just um, um, have point out just oral surgery, but if anyone wants to comment on this, um, was it harder or did you have any obstacles becoming a, as a black uh, female? dentist coming into your residency and your specialty. Oh, you're on mute. Um, I will say that my particular residency was a bit of a unicorn. Um, and I would like to thank Dr. Charles Williams for that. Um, when I came in under me, especially during my chief year, there were three uh, female, black female uh, residents in my program. They only have one per year. So for my particular program, like I said, we were very unique um, for three out of four residents to be African-American uh, females. So, you know, I, I think that that was a, a definitely a, a turning point in that, in that particular program. And I love the fact that Meharry Medical College um, was so pro girl power <laughs> in that regard. Um, however, you know, Unfortunately, the stories are not so happy or um, amongst other colleagues. So, you know, there's, they're definitely nationwide, especially is we are, we are truly a minority. So even though, you know, our program was unique in that fact, um, nationwide, if you look at the numbers, I mean, we're it, minuscule. I mean, it, the, we're less than 2% of uh, oral and maxillofacial surgeons. So it's, it's very different, difficult being in a surgical residency, um, being a woman. Um, and then when you add that, that double minority that, that to that, um, of course, you know, that does tend to make things a little bit more challenging um, for acceptance, uh, for people to, you know, really, I guess, to, I guess to try to, I don't want to say, you know, demean you, um, but a lot of programs in that regard are, are of course, that way. Um, and so, you know, one thing that, that you hear from other colleagues is that, you know, they try to make you cry or they try to make you feel bad about things like that, things that you're doing or just make you feel small. Um, so I'm very fortunate um, in that regard to not have many stories um, that are negative. But that's not the case for everyone, unfortunately. I can chime in on that. Um, I was actually really blessed. I had two great program directors mm -hmm. at Alabama and at MD Anderson. Um, and uh, there were, there was probably more challenges, I think, from uh, co-residents. Um, I did have other faculty that were at the school that were very supportive of me. And uh, I'm kind of hard headed anyway. So if I want something, I'm gonna go for it. <laughs> uh, I, I have to say, um, I've really been grateful that uh, people, certain people were put in my life to help mm -hmm. me that I can be where I am. And uh, I just was voted um, regional director for region four for the American College of Prosthodontics. So I'm on the board of directors now. So um, I was very, thank you. I was very humbled uh, by being appointed at first, but then I had to go through the election and I just found out a week ago. So I'm on directors 
America of Prothonics, which is um, as a regional membership director. So I'm hoping to be able to show that the face of not just dentistry, but prosthodontics is changing and um, hey, we're not going nowhere. <laughs> And I've been, I've, I've been welcomed, so I've, I've been really blessed, I have to say. That's great, that's great. Anyone else come on that, comment on that? Um, well, I know. Just, just, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say just on one, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, when I applied to Baylor, which is now Texas A&M Health Science Center for Orthodontics, uh, they had been in existence for almost 50 years. And I say, fortunately, unfortunately, I was the first black resident that they ever had. And so fortunately now we've had uh, three young ladies and we've had two young men since I was there in 2000. So a program that took almost 50 years to have one uh, that was black, they finally are having many more. So uh, it's a good thing. Yeah. No, and I and, and I, I hope schools, a lot of schools are they putting in place deans, associate deans, and diversity and inclusion. Um, I think in order to increase the number of under my uh, underrepresented minorities, is we have to increase that the applicant pool of candidates who can be successful in dental school and beyond. And uh, yeah, there's one little point I'd like to make, and I've been saying this is. Um, I would really encourage everyone on this panel and other people. Um, I think the one area in diversity we're kind of lacking is lecturers mm -hmm. and people getting out there yeah. being sponsored by the manufacturers and different companies to be able to go out and lecture. So I think that's where diversity, I think, needs to be addressed more and uh, have more diversity of lecturers. That is definitely something I need to I would I would say that we still need to work on and you know that I'm so glad you brought that up because that is something you know after practicing for a couple decades um, to keep that spark alive you kind of need to reinvent yourself or do some other things to keep the excitement and, and I have started to pursue lecturing um, but like you said I had no clue I don't I didn't know anything about sponsorship and so luckily Dr. Joel Berg has been, um, I call him kind of like my agent, <laughs> and that he's helping and prepping me and giving me the information um, in doing it at like a mentor. We, we need to have those who are doing it to reach back and help because um, just like in, in our field though, if people don't see, if the kids don't see us doing it or the students don't see us doing it, then they don't see themselves doing it. So I would encourage that. And I know, I know we've been keeping you guys way beyond the hour. Um, if there, I don't, we'll have to go back. If you guys don't mind, just maybe checking in the comments for any questions. I will also ask you guys to, uh, or the audience, but please take a look at the bios. These doctors are just simply amazing. They, um, some have their Instagram, our social media handles that they share knowledge and pictures and videos and answer questions. So I encourage you to look at that. Um, before we, wrap it up i was just going to go quickly around and if you guys had a just a quick enamel pearl <laughs> that you would want to leave us with just really quick go through that and then I'll, we'll bring this to a, a conclusion <laughs> dr brock uh in all that you do just know you are better than you think you are you can do more than you think you can Set your goals as high as you can get them. Jump, reach, strive daily mm -hmm. to get there. And you know what? You probably will. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. The scripture says that as a man thinketh, so is he. And I just want to tell all of you that if you are interested in doing anything, whether it's dentistry, medicine, or whatever profession that you have, you have to think about uh, taking care of your mind. You have to take care of yourself. Your brain power is um, exquisite. You have the ability to heal yourself with your mind. You have the ability to also destroy yourself with your mind. So if you ever think about developing yourself or if you ever think about um, what it is that is most important, it is always going to be to take care of your mental state and to make sure that you understand that the power of your brain is super, super duper important. Um, as a man thinketh, so is he. Thank you. That's beautiful. 
Becca Boldridge. Becca Eva Boldridge. <laughs> Uh, I think I'll echo both what both doctors said. Um, uh, don't, don't minimize, go for what you want. Don't listen. If someone says you can't do it, you can. You may have a different time frame than what you have planned, but all things can be done. The most important thing is to also remember to keep striving for excellence make sure you figure out a work-life balance and uh, make sure that you're, you're working because you love it and you're taking your time to take care of yourself after hours. That's, that's what I'm learning. <laughs> Work in progress here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so I just wanna say everybody has different paths. Um, I've mentored lots of kiddos and I have lots of friends that went and did things totally different than I did, but we're at the same place. Like we're dental specialists, we're dentists. And for some people that happened literally as a second career after being a teacher or a dental hygienist first. And so there are so many different paths and sometimes there's a different path that you can't even see. And that's part of why you we encourage you to reach out to us, to talk to mentors, to ask for help, because you may just see somebody like, you know, any of us here, like, oh my gosh, yeah, we made it. But there were 50 people plus behind me that I reached out for help for that I said, I don't have a parent that can read my personal statement. Can you help me? I don't know how to even apply for an externship. How do I do that? I didn't know these things, but there were people who were there to help me and help me figure out a path to get here. So just yours may be totally different. Just don't worry if, you know, you're not getting there as fast as you thought you would or you need help. Like, yes, you need help. Everybody needs help. Please, you know, use us. Use every resource you can. That's great. Good advice. Thank you. Dr. Anna Malachi. I apologize in advance. I heard I have a little humming and I'm not sure where it's coming from. Um, but I'll say that the only place that uh, success comes before work is in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. And um, that means you have to put in the work, um, regardless of the color of your skin or whatever it may be, you have to put in the work. And you must ask the small, the dumb, and the big questions. Because likely, the question that you have, somebody else wants to know. And someone else needs to know. So just know that the work has to be put in. We are, we are here, but I know from some of those that I know their stories of it, and my own story, it wasn't easy to get here. Mm -hmm. And so uh, use us. When you need a, a, a word of encouragement, take a picture of the screen if you need to go put it and post it somewhere because we're here and you can be too. Oh, I forgot to do that too. I forgot on the replay. <laughs> Good picture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Portia James. Um, I think I would just say do not let where you come from hinder you from where you're trying to go. You can, you, I'm from Oak Cliff, Texas. I'm from Oak Cliff, which is a suburb outside of Dallas. It's not the best <laughs> place. You can be from the hood. You can go from hood to hooded, I would like to say. Oh, I love that. So, you know, it's, it's just about how hard you're willing to work to be the success story, to get out of the environment um, where you're from. So, it's going to take hard work. It's going to take dedication. Um, it's going to take questions and researching. Sometimes you have, I mean, in the era of Google, you know, there's no excuses anymore. In the era of social media, there's no excuses anymore. You can reach out to various people who are where you are going. I'm not where I, I'm not even where I want to be right now. You know, I have, I still have so many steps that I have to go to get to where I am successful at, so to speak. So it's always gonna be someone 
that you're going to admire. And then you never know, that person might be like, okay, well, I still have to do this or I still have to do that. But the final thing is hard work, dedication, a plan. So sometimes you need help to develop that plan. And so it's up to you to ask those questions. And you can do it. Sure can. And like I said, we did it. So can you. <laughs> okay. Dr. Onkondaye. Um, going last on this, it's a, I, I want to say, obviously, I want to reiterate, it takes a village. You are not going to, this, it takes everyone to help you to get here. I've had mentors and wonderful directors who have helped me get to where I am. Um, but one thing as I get text messages from those who are on Facebook is there's students asking me about money. Don't let money be your drive, please. I beg you to do what you really want to do. Run your own race. Don't do it with a dollar sign at the end because I promise you, you will fall on your face if you do this for money. That is not your drive. Greed brain is a real thing. And we cut corners in dentistry when we do things for money. And so if I could leave you with anything, it's grow where you're planted, which means just work your butt off no matter where you get in residency, no matter what you do, you have to grow where you're planted and be the best you possible. Don't let anybody steal your joy. Don't let them make you feel small, like Dr. Portia said. It doesn't matter where you went to dental school, if it's a historically black college, if it wasn't, if it was this, it doesn't matter. You be you, run your own race, but I promise you, if I can beg you to do anything, you don't have greed brain. That's great advice. Yes, thank you. Well, not quite last. We still have Dr. Morrow. Just came oh, out I'm sorry. The Hollywood Square. He dropped down. <laughs> so all I can say is that I might drop. Um, you know, um, there's a saying, iron sharpens iron. And just listening to all of these beautiful, educated dentists, so inspiring. Um, and so just listening to everyone else talk, uh, talk speak, um, I've had a couple of thoughts. To caveat on the scripture, as a man thinketh, I'd also say life and death are in the power of the tongue. You are, you know, as you think, you know, but you also have to speak what you want, you know. Uh, there is true, there is power in speaking what you, you know, and if you speak long enough, you will start to believe. Um, the other thing I would think to I would say is, begin with the end in mind. Um, there's a, a book out there by Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of his habits is he talks about that all the time. Begin with the end in mind. What do you want ultimately? But not just dental school being an end goal or specialty, specializing being an end goal. Think about where you want your life to be, you know, 20 years from now, you know, what you want to, the life you want to create and then plan backwards from that. Um, and so then from leading on from that, um, if you are concerned about money, and I agree, don't let, don't do dentistry because of money, do it because you feel it's a calling or passion. I do dentistry for free. I've done it for free, uh, remote area, medical events, et cetera, you know, missions of mercy. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why I'm, I, I continue to stay in the military because money is not an option for me. It's never a consideration. I get to truly treat patients and give them what they want as opposed to what they can afford. But if you are concerned about that, I highly encourage people to consider a career um, in, in military dentistry. But even if you aren't thinking about a career in military dentistry, the Health Professional Scholarship Program is probably the best way to pay for dental school. Um, so even if you don't think a career is in your midst, you can think about four years and then you're done. And they'll pay for your complete dental school. You know, if you're very savvy, you can actually invest some money along the way and be in a better position financially down the road as well. Uh, and if anybody wants any information about that, please reach out to me. Um, but thanks again, Dr. Hyshaw, for uh, inviting me to do this. Uh, it's been a great panel, very inspiring. Oh, thank you. Thank you all so, so much. I mean, all the advice, all the enamel pearls, <laughs> the pearls of, of wisdom it, um, really can, uh, I mean, even it doesn't matter where you are in your journey, those that, that advice can you can take with you where you are. Um, I just want to let everyone know that even look, seek a mentor, because even if you're not 100% sure that you want to do dentistry, just look at these professionals on this panel and what they're teaching you. It's not specifically just on their specialty, but it's about taking care of yourself, um, getting rid of that negative self-talk, 
getting rid of any kind of imposter syndrome. It's just getting the habits of working hard, um, learning those study habits. And that's what you'll learn from your, your mentors. So I know right now we didn't get to talk a lot about how shadowing is going here in this COVID world we're living in, but I would recommend, and I, I was speaking with one of our board members, Dr. Edmund Hulett, um, who's a, a Dean, Assistant Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at UCLA. And they are recommending um, that, you know, if you're unable to, to shadow and for these pre-dental students who are applying for dental school and worried about getting those hours, go online. Like I said, I mean, Dr. Yepes has that whole YouTube or uh, Facebook page that has videos, but log your time, log what you saw, log what your takeaways were from that, um, from the presentation that you saw on the webinars. And, and there are some offices. I would say still seek and see if they are open in your area. Um, things will change, uh, but yeah, we are navigating through this in this post COVID world, or I guess we're still COVID world. <laughs> but I would just say that um, still find a mentor. I think that is the number one thing on your path to success in your journey to dental school. And one way we are trying to um, help facilitate that is by building a website that will have the infrastructure of a, or a platform for matching the mentors with the mentees. Right now, it, it is an old school, just kind of mentor matching or trying to match it up. And, and we want to be able to have something that's in place where there's a gallery of profiles of mentors, where they went to school, where they are practicing, and, um, and then the mentees can go and search for a mentor that will work for them. And then there's a capability of chatting or video chatting within the app. But in order to do that, we need to build some capital to get that state of our uh, website going. We were in the beta testing of one, but we, we can't continue unless we get some donations. And so I invite you not only to come check out our, our Facebook community um, so that you can sign up to be a mentor or mentee. We have the links there, the forms to fill out. We can get that started now. But I'll invite you to go to our PayPal link um, to so we can raise some money, so we can do more programming. We want to do STEM education from K through 12. Um, we want to be able to offer scholarships for a DAT course prep. Um, we want to offer money to help pre-dental students who want to apply to more than one dental school but don't have the financial means to do so. Um, we don't want that to be the obstacle that keeps them from applying to dental school. So, um, and then there's just so much more, but we have, we've been on, but so go check that out. Please make a donation from $5 up to however much you, you feel um, in your heart to give. We can use some money for our students so that we can change the face of dentistry. So thank you panelists so much. Thank you audience. I hope you guys all have a wonderful evening, wonderful weekend, ask the questions, stay on, look at their bios, go their, their social media pages and check out their websites and see what our future, our, what our leaders now in dentistry are doing to inspire our future leaders in dentistry. I did it, they did it, we all did it. So we know you can do it too. Thank you and good night. <laughs>